Your kids are already communist, and college will make it worse. The case of Mitch Daniels' curriculum. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Minor Issues Podcast. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. Children in the U.S. are raised to be communist, and most parents are too, even though they don't know it. It doesn't matter if you send them to public or private schools, as all education degree-granting schools bias the learning process against the competitive capitalist, liberal, or open-minded society. Instead, the curriculum is less about learning about reality and is heavy on propagandizing children against capitalism and towards communism or socialism. American society teaches hatred and distrust of everything capitalism. American society teaches hatred and distrust of everything capitalist, even though its benefits are all around us, helping to feed us, clothe us, house us, and protect us. In contrast, the government screws up virtually everything it lays its hands on and charges us double to do so. I remember when I was just a child that my mother would retrieve the morning milk just outside the back door from the milk box. I don't remember how old I was when I finally asked how the milk got there, and my mother told me the milkman put it there. I think I had previously chalked it up to something akin to Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, and when I realized how dark and cold, even snowy it was outside early in the morning, I was amazed. Today, on the drive to work, I heard an otherwise intelligent retired athlete say the following, if you are a billionaire sports team owner, you obviously have screwed a lot of people over. But in the case of building sports stadiums, taxpayer subsidies are needed because they create jobs. (laughs) Everything about that statement is wrong and ignorant. People become billionaires in the first place because they serve their customers well. They outcompete others in serving customers. They normally create tons of high paying jobs, too, including our retired athlete. The exception to this rule is when billions are made from special privileges from the government, like taxpayer subsidies. Taxpayer funded stadiums is the classic case of a losing proposition for the local economy and taxpayers, as study after study has demonstrated. Only a few benefit from the subsidies, including billionaire team owners. With a brainwashed upbringing, is it any wonder that more young adults have a positive view towards socialism than have a positive view towards capitalism. The positive beliefs in socialism only increase with more college education. Those beliefs actually should decline with more education if college was about learning and reality instead of indoctrination. The only silver line and I will link to my journal article on this subject in the show notes, is that the rise of socialist sympathies has driven many others to try and learn more about Austrian economics. One clear sign of socialist bias in higher education is that college professors register Democrat by a number of 10 to 1 compared to Republicans. Of course, Democrat professors are much more likely to favor extreme forms of socialism than are the average American Democrats. And Republican professors are more likely to stay in the closet or they face the mean and career-ending dangers from Marxist professors who often control the campus agenda. 
The Republicans are also much more likely to teach in good career departments, like engineering, where their views would not come into play in the classroom. Now, Mitch Daniels was a pharmaceutical executive who came into the Bush administration to run the Office of Management and Budget. He went on to become a successful two-term governor of Indiana and then president of the prestigious Purdue University. At each stage, he tried and succeeded in trimming the worst excesses of public sector waste and abuse of the taxpayer. He has spoken favorably of Friedrich von Hayek and limited government. At Purdue, the business school is now named the Mitch Daniel School of Business. And at his beckoning, they have set up a mini curriculum called the Cornerstone of Business that proposes to expose students to, quote, transformative texts with deep insights on the history, philosophy, and economic theory of market capitalism. Now, of course, this is a well-intentioned attempt to offset the influence of a culture that increasingly doubts the value that profitable businesses offer to society. This effort should be commended. It recognizes the anti-capitalist influence in American culture and education. It attempts to balance that by exposing the students to transformative text. Of course, that is what a liberal education and a liberal arts school and degree should be, certainly was meant to be, in the first place. Unfortunately, this is only an elective mini-curriculum in business. Students get a certificate for completing a three-course sequence. One, money, trade, and power, the history of capitalism. Two, the history of economic thought. And three, industrial, uh, excuse me, international organization. I was a little surprised it did not include a course in comparative economic systems. That was a standard course that was taught every semester, open to any student, when I was an undergraduate student. The course compared various versions of capitalism and socialism, what the outcomes were. However, my teacher tried to convince us that the Soviet Union would soon dominate the West. It's not taught much anymore, anywhere. I don't think it's been taught at Auburn University for at least four decades, except when I have volunteered to teach it, Uh, basically on a charitable basis. Uh, They haven't even asked me to teach it in almost a decade. But of course, the titles of courses is just a surface issue and is just really a subterfuge in the long run. Uh, Also, the titles of professors don't really matter. I'm afraid that if every economics, history, and philosophy department in the country had a Murray Rothbard professorship, a named endowed professorship, that it wouldn't change a thing. The University of Missouri, for example, was given millions of dollars for six chaired professorships in Austrian economics, and they just handed them out to seemingly random business professors with no connection to the Austrian School of Economics. In an extremely unusual outcome, however, the university was successfully sued for their egregious actions against the donor's wishes and had to return the money. But most donors, in fact, virtually every donor is not so lucky. And here is really the underlying crux to the matter in the classroom. Current professors don't really know what they're talking about concerning the relevant issues. They only mimic the political propaganda that their own professors gave them. The story suits the agenda, so it gets retold as if it's a real theory or a real history. 
In reality, these stories often simply fly in the face of logic. But because professors and students are not taught true critical thinking or exposed to competing approaches, they never really think about it or question it. The only critical thinking in modern academia on the modern campus that stands out to me is criticisms of capitalism, whether they're real or imagined. Here is a case in point. It is widely taught that labor unions caused wages to go up, improved working conditions, reduced hours of work, eliminated women and children labor, etc., etc. Issues that are bound to come up in a variety of various history and economics classes. The problem with this story is that increased wages and benefits, etc., require free market capitalism and private property rights in the first place to generate the necessary savings and capital investment in worthwhile production. Capitalist accumulation occurred before the labor guilds of Europe. The Industrial Revolution preceded labor unions entirely. Capitalism proliferated the higher skilled labor and the higher paying jobs on what on which unions are based. All of the benefits that labor enjoys first appeared in the marketplace without government or union intervention. Henry Ford started the $5 per day uh, workday because he wanted a dependable, highly skilled workforce, and the workers loved it. Now, unions do benefit their members, but they hurt the employers and the customers. They also can only sustain their higher paying uh, by excluding others from skilled positions. So many people in the workforce are actually hurt by unionism. The net result is that labor in general is not better off and unionized economies go into decline. Fortunately, the U.S. is one of the least unionized uh, economies in the world, and it's also the most dynamic advanced economy in the world. If you listen to your professors and their students, you would think only children would be working in factories and that no one would ever have a day off from work if it wasn't for unions and the government. The capitalist process is responsible for higher wages and higher standards of living. As a system, governmental action and violent union activity can only drag down its beneficial social effects. And this is just one example of what passes for higher education in the classroom. Don't expect government bureaucrats and politicians to solve this problem. They're the ones that created it. Thank you.